Hello everyone. Today we are going to discuss the essay The Storyteller Reflections on the Works of Nikolai Leskov by Walter Benjamin. Walter Benjamin was a famed Frankfurt critic and uh, today in this discussion we are not going to so much stress on the works of Leskov, but we are going to see the theoretical stance that Benjamin takes when he defines who a storyteller is. How is he different from the modern novelist and other factors that he brings in. And I would like to point out from the beginning to take note of how the storyteller is in a sense kind of anticipates uh, in a postmodern way the critique of the authorship that Barth and Foucault undertake. Um, Barth also uh, in, in his 1966 essay uh, Death of the Author declares that the author is dead and the birth of the reader happens and Foucault also after some time writes the essay called uh, Who is an Author. Uh, so, we need to look at this essay that um, Benjamin is kind of anticipating their arguments in terms of authorship, in terms of like the authority of an authorship. When he talks about the storyteller, what he stresses more is on the agency of storytelling than an authority over the story. So, the storyteller in this thing is not a person of capitalist production, is not a person who gets money for writing, he is not a professional per se, but what he does is a more, has a more social value than a more money making or a more professional value. So, before long let us get into the essay and we will read uh, critical excerpts from the essay and then we will talk about a little bit, but Benjamin if we read through it we will see that he explains himself very well. So, at the beginning he poses the storyteller as a person who often comes from far away, comes from far away lands with far away experiences, with new experiences, experiences that we do not have and sometimes it is important to have to, to pay heed to other people's experiences. If we look at uh, Rabindranath Tagore's short story Kabuliwala, we see that there is a Kabuliwala who comes from Afghanistan and there is this Bengali girl, little girl to him uh, to whom he tells his stories and we see that there is this huge difference, he is a man, he is an elderly man, she is a small girl and one is from Bengal, one is from Afghanistan, but still in the form of storytelling, in the all the stories that he tells Mimi that we see that there is a bonding that happens between them. So, and uh, Benjamin also starts in the same vein, he says that familiar though his name may be to us, the storyteller in his living immediacy is by no means a present force. He has already become something remote from us and something that is getting even more distant. So, you can see that he is using the awareness, the far awareness of the storyteller in double use here. He is saying that it is a storyteller is often a person who comes from far, but it is a condition of our times that he is also getting farther away from us. So, and then he goes on to say that this distance and this angle of vision are prescribed for us by an experience which, may, which we may have almost every day. It teaches us that the art of storytelling is coming to an end. Less and less frequently do we encounter people with the ability to tell a tale properly. And you can see this, this line is very important, this distance and this angle of vision. So, his, we can already see that he is positioning himself to a place, he is positioning himself to a place from where he is looking at things. And if you look at the idea of modern theory, the word theory also comes from the word seeing in a sense. So, he is theorizing here and he is po pointing to us that the essential work of theorizing, the essential work of thinking about something is also an essential work of seeing and seeing from a certain point of view. It is as if something that seemed inalienable to us, the securest among our possessions were taken from us, the ability to exchange experiences. So, he kind of says that the uh, ability to exchange experiences is a fundamental uh, right of human beings, it is something that human beings do. And if we take a look at modern neuro studies, uh, we will see that what differentiates humans from other animals mostly is that our ability to tell stories. So, there are really any other animal that tells stories to each other, but humans have something that they tell stories, they share experiences in the forms of stories, not in direct practical knowledge, but in forms of stories. So, we have that power of narrative, narration, but he is saying that slowly that key sign of humanity, that key sign of being human is being taken away from us and it is slowly moving away from us. He says one reason for this phenomenon is obvious, experience has fallen in value and it looks as if it is continuing to fall into bottomlessness. Every glance at a newspaper demonstrates that it has reached a new low 
that are picture not only of the external world, but of the moral world as well. Overnight has undergone changes which we never thought was possible. So, we see that what he Benjamin says the storyteller exchanges primarily is experience. So, storyteller is a person who comes from far through his journeys, he learns things, he experiences things and when he comes to a place or she comes to a place, he tells us certain things that we learn about. So, he is saying that that kind of experience is slowly going away. If we remember our childhood, most of us who had grandparents in our place, we would see that they would tell us stories of their times. So, that is what they were doing, they were imparting their experience to us. But now that we see that families are slowly getting drifted apart, a little time, family time, fam spending time together is getting a little more problematic, we see that these experiences are not coming to us this through the art of storytelling. And he is saying that, um, was it not noticeable at the end of the war that men returned from the battlefield grown silent? not richer, but poorer in communicable experience. So, the war he is talking about is the first world war that took place and it is very interesting. So, when we just discussed that when someone goes far away, for someone goes away, when they come back they have experiences to tell us about, but he is saying that the war is such a thing where if you go you do not come back with a lot to speak about. Instead, when you come back, you come back with a lot of speechlessness, you can barely speak and if we read the novel um, Mrs. Dalloway by Virginia Woolf, we will see that the character Septimus Smith is an ideal example of this. So, after the first world war, this condition in Maine was uh, diagnosed as PTSD, post traumatic stress disorder or shell shock. So, it was thought that so much bombing, so much sound kind of made men numb and they were barely able to speak and they could not communicate their experiences. So, that is what uh, Benjamin is talking about here. He is saying that the war has made us speechless, it has made us talk less and less and less. And he is saying that for never has experience been contradicted more thoroughly than strategic experience by tactical warfare, economic experience by inflation, bodily experience by mechanical warfare and moral experience by those in power. So, these experiences, these new forms of experiences, inflation, power, warfare, he is saying that these are not conventional human experiences. The art of storytelling according to him is something that came naturally to us. It was something that made us human, but these new experiences, these are more concocted experiences that is kind of undermining our way of being human and how we have been human for a long time. And he is saying that a generation that had gone to school on a horse drawn street car now stood under the open sky in a countryside in which nothing remained unchanged but the clouds. And beneath those clouds in a field of force of destructive torrents and explosions was the tiny fragile human body. So, we see here that Benjamin poses the art of storytelling also as an embodied condition. It is something that it also incorporates the body because you take your body, you take your mind through these different places and you come back and you tell the story. But if the body is under threat, so will the mind be. So, he is talking about an embodied consciousness here. And uh, now he talks about the importance of experience that we discussed in the previous uh, pa paragraph. Experience which is passed on from mouth to mouth is the source from which all storytellers have drawn. And among those who have written down the tales, it is the great ones whose written versions differs least from the speech of the many nameless storytellers. So, it is very interesting here that he says mouth to mouth, not mouth to ear. So, we see that he is suggesting a certain flow that if we say mouth to ear, it seems that the person who listens does not communicate it further. But for Benjamin, storytelling is an act of communication that keeps on going. So, he very consciously uses the term mouth to mouth. So, you tell the story to someone else and that person will also tell that story to someone else and it will keep traveling and he is saying that among those who have written down the tales, it is the great ones whose written version differs least from speech of the many nameless storytellers. So, if we look at many stories, many folk tales, many fairy tales, we will see that they do not have any authors, but they have been told for generations and we have been told them by people we know and that is how they move on and we do not know who the authors are, but the thing is every time that story is told, the intactness of that story is kept and it is probably the teller adds something to it and makes it more interesting for the person who it is being told to. When someone goes on a trip, he has come something to tell about, goes on the German saying and people imagine the storyteller who has come from afar. But they enjoy no less listening to the man who has stayed at home, 
making an honest living and who knows the local tales and traditions. So again, we are brought back to the idea that storyteller is also a person who comes from far, but it also can be a person who stays at home, who stays at home and imparts knowledge, imparts wisdom. And again, we are reminded of our grandparents who would probably be there and if we go to them, they would have a lot of stories to tell. And he is saying that the most archaic representatives of the storyteller is the resident tiller, uh, man of the soil and the other is the trading seaman. So, but he is saying that there is, if, even if it seems that there is a, an essential difference between one person and the other, the one person lives on the land, lives on the soil and tills the soil and the other person makes his living from the sea, but they all come together and they all come together, the diversity comes together by the act of storytelling. He is saying that the resident master craftsman and the traveling journeyman worked together in the same rooms and every master had been a traveling journeyman before he settled down in his home somewhere else. So, we see that he is saying that uh, everyone who has traveled or is staying at home had traveled once and everyone who is traveling now will have to get back to home and stay there. So, it is a cycle as we already mentioned that storytelling is also a cycle. You tell the story to someone, that person tells it to another person. So, this cyclical nature he is talking about it, but he is also talking about that the war, the, ex, the onslaught to experience, human experience brought about by war is a sort of thing that breaks this cycle, breaks this cycle that has been sustaining us for so long. Now, he points out uh, to how Leskov was one of the ideal storytellers and he is saying that Leskov was at home in distant places as well as distant times. He was member of the Greek Orthodox Church but he was no less sincere opponent of ecclesiastic bureaucracy. So, we see here, um, we have also discussed Arnold's essay, um, Sweetness and Light and we saw there how Arnold also criticized um, um, institutional religion, institutionalization of religion and he is saying that Leskov here also was religious, but he opposed the Greek Orthodox Church, the institutionalization and he was also opposed to ecclesiastic bureaucracy. Then he said that the official positions he held were not of long duration. So, he was not in one place for a long time and Russia, he was the Russian representative of a big English firm and was presumably the most useful one of his writing. So, that being that Russian representative of a big English firm. So, we see again that cultural collision that it is not one pure culture that is cape that is segregated, but no, but storyteller comes from a different culture goes into a different culture and tells people about different cultures. So, he is a Russian representative of a big English farm. So, here we see again a very coming together of cultures which is very important a mixing together of cultures. And he travelled through Russia and in the Russian regions Leskov saw allies in his fight against orthodox bureaucracy. There are a number of his legendary tales whose focus is a righteous man, seldom an ascetic, usually a simple active man who becomes a saint apparently in the most natural way in the world. So, he is saying that the people of Leskov, they are not ascetics, but they are people of the world, they are people with worldly knowledge and that is something Benjamin is also hinting here. In Benjamin's writing, we will not see something of a transcendental value, he is not saying that we need to value transcendental things and let go of things that are of this world, but he is positioning the storyteller as someone who is very worldly, who is very worldly wise, who has got to give very worldly wisdom and that is very important here. His first printed work was entitled, Why are books so expensive in Kiev? A number of other writings about the working class, alcoholism, police doctors and unemployed salesmen are precursors of his works of fiction. So, we see that um, when we are talking about Arnold and his definition of culture, he also said that culture is not a badge. Uh, that you wear for elitism. It is not something that should set you apart from other people, but something that should bring people together. And here we also see that in Benjamin's idea of the storyteller, you must write stories, you should write stories about people from all stairs of society and we will see, he will come back to it again and say how the storyteller moves very easily between these layers of society. An orientation towards practical interest is characteristic of many born storytellers. So, we see here that this worldly importance, the things are importance of learning wildly th worldly things, the importance of learning practical things. It is not about uh, metaphysical preoccupations that are not important to us or that are very elitist or uh, for some philosophers the common people cannot understand, but it is more about practical interest. It is told by common people and it is for common people.
all these points for the nature of every real story it contains openly or covertly something useful. So, this um, stress on something useful might sound a little archaic to our ears, but what Benjamin is saying here it is not something moral that is strict guideline for society, but a form of wisdom. So, the moral is something that the storyteller has learned, has experienced with his life and is telling us which from which we can learn. The usefulness may in one case consist in a moral and we also saw in sweetness and light how Arnold says that morality should still be a consideration that culture takes morality into consideration. In another in some practical advice in a third in a proverb or maxim. In every case the storyteller is a man who has counsel for his readers. But if today having counsel is beginning to have an old fashioned ring this is because the communicability of experience is decreasing. In consequence, we have no counsel either for ourselves or for others. After all, counsel is less an answer to a question than a proposal concerning the continuation of a story which is just unfolding. To seek this counsel, one would have first have to tell the story. So, this part is very important. So, he is saying to seek counsel, we must also learn to tell stories. Now, if we look at psychoanalysis that came up during the first world war and everything that was called the talking cure. So, there the person who is going out to seek a solution to his problems would have to first tell the story, tell his own story to the therapist, to the psychoanalyst. And if we read Freud, we will see that what Freud and other psychoanalysts do at that time is to take the story of the person who is being psychoanalyzed of the patient and continue the story in a sense. So, when the person who is on the psychoanalyst chair is asking for counsel, he is also telling a story, he is also telling his own story, there is nothing different than that. And when the psychoanalyst is also responding, he is also telling another story back to him. So, we see that seeking counsel, this answering is a form of form of storytelling in this sense. So, we can relate it very nicely to the way psychoanalysis or talking cure came up during that time. And he is saying counsel woven into the fabric of real life is wisdom. The art of storytelling is reaching its end because the epic side of truth wisdom is dying out. So, he is saying that there is a lack of wisdom in our world, that wisdom is slowly dying away. This however, is a process that has been going on for some time and he is saying that it is slowly been vanishing this art of wisdom and we will see why he means what he means. He will slowly ex, um, explicate on that. The earliest symptom of a process whose end is decline of storytelling is the rise of the novel. So, here we see that Benjamin is posing the rise of the novel as in the opposite spectrum of the decline of the storytelling. So, as the rise of the novel is happening, the storytelling is declining. But why is that? What distinguishes the novel from the story is its essential dependence on the book. The dissemination of the novel becomes possible only with the invention of printing. So, this is very interesting. So, while storytelling did not require any printed medium, it did not require anything between the storyteller and the person, it's the story is getting told, there, is, there would nothing that would need to be written or recorded, but just memory. So, person would speak, another person would listen, remember and it would be so impressive that the person would go back and again tell that to another person. But what he is saying that the invention of printing has changed that. So, now a person does not need to be in front of another person to tell a story. They can write a book, that book can go through the printing press and reach the readers just like that. There does not need to be a direct contact between who is telling and who is being told. What differentiates the novel from other forms of prose literature, the fairy tale, the legend or even the novella is that it neither comes from Mullah tradition neither goes into it, nor goes into it. This distinguishes it from storytelling in particular. The storyteller takes what he tells from experience, his own that he reported by others and he in turn makes it the experience of those who are listening to his tale. The novelist has isolated himself, the birthplace of the novel is a solitary individual. He is himself uncounseled and cannot counsel others. So, Benjamin is very right when he is pointing this out. So, we can see that their books have been written that during the rise of the novel, the architecture of English houses had changed. They had changed in a way that they gave the modern person, the modern person more freedom, more isolation. So, writing a novel as he points out, even if we see the novel Clarissa, 
we'll see that Clarissa, while she writes, she locks herself away in a chamber and she vigorously writes away letters. So, we see that the novelist is almost a Clarissa like figure or even the person who is the captor of Clarissa, uh, also even like that person. So, they both when they write, they isolate themselves, the writing does not take place in the presence of others. So, reading the novel is almost a voyeuristic thing, it is almost take looking into something that has been produced in a private sphere, but as opposed to the storyteller as opposed to storytelling when it is told in open and you get to meet the person who is telling you the story. So, this is very important that he is right when he is pointing out that the birth of the novel actually happens because the novelist has been given that space to isolate himself. And he uh, gives the example of the Bildungsroman. So, the Bildungsroman is a form of writing that traces the growth of a person. Um, Great Expectations by Charles Dickens would be a really good example of uh, Bildungsroman. So, what we see in Great Expectations is a person called Peep growing up and we see Peep's life is fraught with pitfalls. There is no one whom we can look to for counsel. He must assume things as he goes along, go along, uh, goes along and we see that he is always uh, haunted by this anonymous benefactor. So, he does not know who the benefactor is, he thinks that somebody is channeling his life, somebody wants him to become something, but he does does not know actually what it is. And his life is spent in that confusion and he, when he finally meets his benefactor, he sees it is Abel Magwitch, a criminal convict from before. So, that knowledge, that wisdom when it finally comes to him, it hits him. So, we see the exactly what happens here uh, is pointed out by Benjamin. Benjamin uh, warns us exactly by about this, that this isolated uh, existence of the author, this isolated power that the author of the novel, novel has runs very contradictory to the power the storyteller has. So, the novelist writes from afar and we do not know the person, we do not know where he is coming from, but the writing comes from and we assume things. But the storyteller he comes in front of us. So, if we also look at a very 2013 adaptation of um, the Mr. G Great Expectations, it is called Mr. Peep, it is a novel and it has also been made into a movie. So, there we see a class teacher who reads from the book and he makes omissions and everything, but he kind of makes it by about himself and the students start calling him Mr. Peep. So, we see that how the storyteller also becomes a character in his story. I would suggest if possible you take a look at the movie or uh, read the book after you take a look at Great Expectations and that can be read very nicely in the light of this essay. And he goes on to say that it took the novel whose beginnings go back to antiquity hundred of years before it encountered the evolving middle class whose elements it was favorable, favorable in its flowering. So, we see that um, here Benjamin is also holding the middle class at, at a certain responsible for a certain few things and if we remember Arnold in his sweetness and light, he also calls the middle class the Philistines and he says that the Philistines, the middle class must take more responsibility in upholding the values of society and uh, the certain uh, moral pitfall, the certain pitfalls that have happened in society is because the middle class has taken upon itself to make the pursuit of riches, the pursuit of wealth uh, as an end to itself. So, here also Benjamin is pointing out how the middle class is very complicit with this rise of the novel and the fall of the storytelling and he says that one of the reasons why this happens is the middle class impo middle classes stress on the information, the act of information that has slowly according to him um, substituted wisdom. So, information wisdom is another binary that uh, Benjamin uh, draws upon and he says that the founder of Le Figaro said an attack fire in the Latin quarter is more important than a revolution in Madrid. This makes strikingly clear that it is no longer intelligence coming from afar, but the information which supplies the handle for what is nearest that gets the readiest hearing. The intelligence that came from afar whether the spatial kind from foreign countries or the temporal kind of tradition possessed an authority which gave it validity even when it was not subject to verification. So, information and if we see that it has become a much bigger nuisance in our times, but he is saying that with information, the rise of information, our worlds have gotten smaller. We are more interested in what is happening around us in a very close quarter than what is happening in the wider world, what is happening in the outside world. So, when we began the essay, we saw that he was posing the storyteller as a man who comes from afar, who as Leskov, who was a um, British uh, person working as in a Russian 
territory. So there was this intermingling of culture. There is this person who is coming from a different culture and going into a different culture. But here we see that we are slowly becoming more cloistered, we are slowly becoming more narrow minded in our worldview. And why is that? It is because of information. Now, if we look at the recent concerns about uh, elections and everything and we see that information manipula manipulation, mi spreading of misinformation, disinformation has become a very important thing. We have something called fake news these days. So, this is what uh, Benjamin is uh, slowly approaching. He could see that this huge stress of information on information could slowly lead us to a place where uh, the world could be dominated by fake news, where uh, this manipulation of information could bring governments into power. So, to, from borrow the, to borrow from the miraculous, it is indispensable for information to sound plausible. So, information must always sound believable and that is the problem. So, now information must sound believable. So, whenever we are given any information, we tend to think that it is true and that is how fake news goes around because we believe that since it is information, it must be true. And he says that it is incompatible with the spirit of storytelling. If the art of storytelling has become rare, it is because the dissemination of information has had a decisive share in its state of affairs. So, we would rather look at some information, some numbers than hear another person say out their experiences about things. And he is talking about the newspaper, how every morning it brings us news, but the information it brings to us is making us poorer than making us richer. And he goes on to give us the example of Herodotus's um, story on the Egyptian king Saminitus, who was um, captured by another king and while he was standing, his family was being paraded in front of him and taken for execution. And he was very straight faced till he saw his wife, his children being carried. But when he saw finally that his old servant was also being carried away, he finally broke into tears and, and kind of hit his head. So, we see that Benjamin here says that there are multiple ways that we can interpret this story. So, the story does not tell us that ok interpret it this way and the story does not encode itself or decode itself for our own pleasure. So, we have to hear it and we have to decode it according to our minds what the story should tell us and in this page he gives a brilliant um, explanation on how this story can be read. I would suggest you read that, but all of them are plausible and all of them show that there is a certain point of view in the world that we must believe in to believe that this is what the story is about. Now, why did the king did not, why did the king not cry when he saw his family being taken away for execution, but when his old servant was being taken for execution, he cried, he, he, he burst out into tears. So, it suggests you read up his um, explanation and see which one seems the most plausible to you. He says that the storytelling, the stories preclude psychological analysis and he is saying that um, this process of assimilation that uh, ass assimilation by assimilation he means when we hear a story we assimilate the story. So, and we must assimilate the story to speak it later again because if we are not listening to it properly not assimilating it we cannot impart it to another person. And he is saying that uh, this process of assimilation it is helped by the process of boredom. And he says, if sleep is the apogee of physical relaxation, boredom is the apogee of mental relaxation. So, he is saying that storytelling is not an act that you do in a very tensed way. It is not uh, listening to a story is not something that you do like a chore. It is not something you do because you have to do because it is something when you you are relaxing your mind, you are bored and you are listening to a story and here he is not using the term boredom in a very negative way. If we read this passage, we will see how romantic um, uh, Benjamin was in his outlook. He says, boredom is the dream bird that hatches the egg of experience. A rustling in the leaves drives him away. His nesting places, the activities that are intimately associated with boredom are already extinct in the cities and are declining in the country as well. So, boredom for uh, Benjamin is a very important thing. He is pointing out how in the modern life in our hustle and bustle, there is very little time when we have to get bored and also if we are getting bored, we think we are missing out on life that ok, I am bored, I must do something, something like that, that we are missing out on life. But instead he says that boredom is a very important part of our lives, that we must learn how to sit still and listen to stories in that time. 
and he is also saying that for storytelling is always the art of repeating stories. So, telling story is always also a retelling of stories because it is not the first time the story is getting told. So, it would be interesting to look at the poem uh, The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner by H.T. Coleridge in that light. So, we see that Coleridge or the persona in the poem is actually going into a place and there the old sailor is telling him a story and we see that the sailor is a storyteller in this sense. He has come from far, he has strange experiences that he is telling to Coleridge and Coleridge is listening to that and also writing it for our sake. But when he is writing, he is writing it in a narrative style. It is almost like what since he cannot tell the story to us directly, he writes it as his experience of listening to that person to keep it intact, to keep the experience of listening to a story, the thrill of listening to a story intact. And here he says that writing in uh, the later times it has become a profession now, it is something that you make money through. So, you write for the market and there we see a lot of market books that make a lot of money, but have barely any, um, any wisdom to impart. They are just being written. So, we can go through them and throw them away into the dustbin after some time and many of those books we will not even remember after 50 years. But he says that writing he says in one of his letters is to me no liberal art, but a craft. It cannot come as a surprise that he felt bonds with craftsmanship, but faced industrial technology as a stranger. So, here we see it is a very interesting thing that writing for Leskov was not a liberal art, but a craft. It was more like some uh, work of weaving or work of building something. And it is also not a form of industrial production, but more of a non-industrial production, more of a cottage industry in that sense. And his, uh, Benjamin cites Paul Valery as one who has also given similar kind of Im imagi imagination about uh, what writing is. And he says, modern man no longer works at what cannot be abbreviated. And also mentions that miniatures, ivory carvings elaborated uh, to the point of greatest perfection. If we go back to um, Jane Austen, what she said about writing Pride and Prejudice, she said that I have been that it was her own piece of ivory that she has been perfect in, she has been crafting. So, in Jane Austen's work uh, writing, even though she was a novelist, we see that the same ethos is uh, reflected that she thinks of herself not as a liberal artist, but a craftsman, a craftsman who has been working on a novel like a person would work on a piece of ivory, slowly, slowly building it. And he says that modern man can no longer at what uh, no longer works at what cannot be abbreviated. So, we are um, scared of things that cannot be abbreviated. Um, we, we, we are scared of that soli solidity and information has become the way we abbreviate things these days. But as uh, Benjamin says that that kind of abbreviation is problematic, that kind of use of numbers to tell I mean if we told that this many people have died of hunger in uh, a place, have died from a famine, but those just come to us as numbers, numbers that people probably got killed from bombing, people that killed from hunger, that does not make any sense to us. But if we could listen to actual person from that place who was starving, to hear that experience of starvation, we would have more moral reaction to it, we have more impulse to do something about it. Next, Benjamin talks about uh, the slowly fading importance of death in uh, society. So, he is saying that the idea of eternity has ever had its strongest source in death. If this idea declines, so it is in the face of death must have changed. So, he is talking about how death has slowly been moved away from our homes and houses. So, he is saying that previously every house in a country would have a place where people would be taken to die and it would be a spectacle. Everyone around the house would also see that person dying, passing on. So, we see also here how passing on has this strong correlation with storytelling. When we are also telling a story, we are passing a story on and when we also die, we pass on to another realm, uh, into a more transcendental realm. So, he is saying what gave authority to the storyteller was the authority of death that we can pass on, we can pass on not ourselves, but our experiences can be also passed on. 
but he's saying that slowly dying has been taken out from the houses and it has been taken into the hospital so our houses have been made a more sanitized place where death we cannot witness the spectacle of death and the hospitals are also sanitized spaces where people are taken to die where death is almost whitewashed so this passing on this passing on of experience this passing on of people it is slowly been taken away and we if we read someone like foucault in his book like the birth of the clinic we see how the gaze of the doctor has come in and everything where the patient can no longer tell his story but the doctor looks at the patient as and turning a subject into an object that they have the final authority in the narrative about the patient so here we see also Fuc um, benjamin anticipating Foucault's argument that the hospital as a place where we go to lose our sense of narrative where we go to lose our authority over our narratives and uh, to cite the importance of death he refers to a story by johann peter hebel and the story is called the unexpected reunion so he says that in this story um, so a man is supposed to get married to his wife the next day but before the day of the marriage he works in a mine and he goes there and he dies and he is uh, covered in iron vitriol that kind of freezes his body without old age but the uh, the to be bride goes go, grows old she doesn't like stay young forever but after a lot of years when the man is taken up he is still uh, frozen in that same manner the age has not passed but to give an idea of the time that has passed uh, and uh, Benjamin quotes from the story I suggest you read it he says that Hebel uses many instances of death and destruction to signify to the passing of time so the storyteller when he talks about the passing of time about eternity about this passing on he must also talk about passing on as we pass on in death so death becomes a, a very important aspect of storytelling that we cannot um, av avoid and then he talks about the epic and how the chronicle has been a form of epic which has been helping in historiography has been helping in uh, preserving history like that and he says that uh, the storyteller the chronicler is perceived in change from secularized as it were so we see the important of uh, importance of secularization here also that uh, benjamin and arnold as we have seen that they do not uh, deny the uh, impact religion has had in society but they also see also note that some of those function are still alive in society in a more secularized fashion in a fashion where people can take part irrespective of where it's coming from it's not restricted to certain religious beliefs and he talks about the alexandrite a story and where he says that uh, so it's almost like he's um, vouching for astrology here but it's not like that so he's saying that uh, in the story it is uh, lamented how different planets that we did not know the unknowns how they shaped our lives and uh, how they say uh, and how it was said that they also control our lives but now we can see that everything uh, such such beliefs have been dispelled and there are no unknowns out there we almost know all the galaxies that are out there we have named them we have named the farthest stars but there was a time when we probably knew very little about the cosmic world and a lot was left up to imagination and again like if we see the the uh, whole idea about those planets uh, determining our way of life is also the in a sense the far impacting the near so he's saying that the storyteller is a person again stressing that the storyteller is someone who comes from far and he kind of dissolves these boundaries of what is far and what is near as they both come together in the storyteller but with information he's saying we are building these boundaries around us where the far we we still pushing the far farther away so that it cannot come to us and this is exactly the same thing that is pointing out here with the cosmos that we used to feel that the influence that the world has on us was very very far away it, it could influence us from very farther away and if we look at something like judith butler's a certain precarity she talks about uh, in in this vein where she says that if we are turning the newspaper one day or turn on the tv and we see someone suffering the image of someone suffering suddenly we do not ask to see these images of suffering but when they hit us they 
make us feel that we have an ethical obligation towards doing something for those people and sometimes it does not matter from how far that image is coming but the fact that human suffering or any other kind of suffering can make us feel about feel like that about people we do not know people who are far away from us is still a sort of faith in humanity that we can keep it is the essential way of being human and here we see that um, Benjamin is talking about the importance of memory that it has seldom been realized that the listener's naive relationship to the storyteller is controlled by his interest in retaining what is told and he calls and this power of retaining is memory that we can retain what we are told and he says memory is the epic faculty per excellence. Only by virtue of a comprehensive memory can epic writing absorb the course of events on the one hand and with the passing of this make its peace with the power of death on the other. So, what is memory here? Memory stands against death in uh, Benjamin's theorization. So, we have memories and we recount those memories to others and when they listen to those, our memories become their memories. Memories are something we can transmit to other people, we can pass on to other people while our bodies, our lives may pass on, our memories will keep passing on through people whom we can tell about it. We can still pass on our memories to others and that way death can still be put away. We can still not be haunted by death knowing that our memories, our way of living will be passing on through other people. Yeah, he says memory creates a the chain of tradition which passes uh, happening on from generation to generation. It starts the way which all stories together form in the end. Shahrazade who thinks of a fresh story when even her tale comes to stop. So, uh, we see that he is talking about web and web uh, it reminds us of intertextuality as later theorized by many postmodern thinkers that texts are not bound in books that they overflow there is a flowing of text one text leads to the other and another text leads to the other. So, there is this intertextuality that Benjamin is already talking about about an interconnectivity and he, he, let us remember that he is talking before the start of the internet and with the internet this wave has grown larger and larger and as we call it world wide web. So, he is kind of talking about that intertextuality how one text points to other and they are they can work in harmony in, in that way. And he also refers to Shahrazadeh from uh, 1001 Arabian Nights and we also see Salman Rushdi talking about this that Shahrazadeh she is told that she must tell a story otherwise she will be killed and every night she must come up with one story so she does not get killed. So, storytelling as Benjamin also says here is runs counter to death. It is something that will always postpone death. It will always postpone the finality of our lives that ok here it stops. No, the, by storytelling the, through memories, the transmission of memories it can always continue, it can always pass on to the next person. Um, here he talks about the reader, how a reader of a novel is very different from a listener of a story. He says, a man listening to a story is in the company of the storyteller. Even a man reading one shares this companionship. The reader of a novel however, is isolated more so than any other reader. So, we see often that the image of reading a novel is given as a secluded act that uh, the book and I we can be lost in a corner away from the world someplace. In this solitude of his, the reader of a novel seizes upon his material more jealously than anyone else. He is ready to make it completely his own, to devour it as it were. Indeed, he destroys, he swallows up the material as the fire devours the log in the fireplace. The suspense which permeates the novel is very much like the draft which sim stimulates the flame in the fireplace and enlivens its play. So, reading a novel is to Benjamin is almost like consuming something voraciously, it is eating something up and we see why that image is very problematic and it is also not a communal eating, it is not an eating that takes place in, in the presence of everything. If you remember Jesus in his last supper, he did not take the meal by himself, but he was uh, surrounded by all his apostles and he shared the bread, shared the wine with everyone else. So, there is this difference that there is this contrast that is um, Benjamin bringing out with eating alone, selfishly devouring things and eating in company, telling stories in company where everyone comes together and listens to stories. 
And here uh, Benjamin again comes back to what Arnold has also talked about culture that it is a great leveler. It does not make upper higher class or lower classes in society, but kind of levels people and it, it, it has that free mobility to move in different spheres of society. So, he is saying that all great storytellers have in common the freedom with which they move up and down the rungs of their experience as on a ladder. A ladder extending downward to the interior of the earth and disappearing into the clouds is the image for a collective experience to which even the deepest shock of individual experience death constitutes no impediment or barrier. And they lived happily ever after, says the fairy tale. The fairy tale which to this day is the first tutor of children because it was once the first tutor of mankind secretly lives on in the story. The first true storyteller is and will continue to be the teller of fairy tales. So, we saw how fairy tales and folk tales they do not have authors assigned to them. They have been handed down from generation to generation even if they have been written mostly they do not have an explicit author associated to them. We know that through the retellings okay, this person retold this story or this person retold that story, but they do not have a central author associated with them. Um, so, I would ask you uh, to read the whole essay and but we are today approaching the end and we will uh, conclude here and he says the storyteller he is the man who could let the wick of his life be consumed completely by the gentle flame of his story. This is the basis of the incomparable aura about the storyteller in Leskov as in Hoff, in Poe as in Stevenson. The storyteller is the figure in which the righteous man encounters himself. So, we see that the storyteller is someone who would be con who would be consumed completely by the gentle flame of his story. So, we saw just a few minutes back how reading a novel was about voracious, it was about almost lighting a huge fire and getting burned in that. But the storyteller is like a gentle flame, it is like a smaller flame by which the storyteller lives and the storyteller is always aware of his own passing life, of his own death. But what promotes his storytelling is that awareness of death that one day we shall all die with our own experiences and if we do not communicate our experiences, the wisdom whatever we might have learned from our lives, then our lives will become less meaningful and our lives will become less impactful. Through the simple act of storytelling, through the simple act of telling others what has happened to us without any psychological coloring, without telling them what they should take from it, but just telling them that okay, this is what happened to me and you should know about it. So, there is a certain wisdom in how we live, in how we tend to pass our lives, in how we tend to survive in this world. Because the world can often be cruel and to survive in a world, to be something in a world is of great power and that is something we can tell others that okay, this is how we survived and probably this is how you can survive too. So, this is a beautiful essay that I would like you to read in, in, in its entirety because he makes some beautiful points in there that we have due to the lack of a time and scope we could not reach today. But if you want to discuss them further, please post a comment in uh, the forum and we will uh, take it up. So, thank you for listening.